My name's Nell, and I love brains. I love all sorts of brains, be they biological, be they machine. I'm fascinated by them. And I'm fascinated about intelligence in its myriad different forms, and also consciousness. But intelligence and consciousness are concepts that mean slightly different things to different people. Take, for example, our bunny, our monkey, and our human. Superficially, they're quite similar. They have similar mammalian brains. And yet the way that those operate are rather different. How, how many of you are Star Trek fans? I know I am. Often in Star Trek, they talk about the search for sentient life forms. And sentient, they often take to mean intelligent or can communicate and things like that. But as a word, sentient rather means that something is able to have subjective experiences. It is able to feel emotions, right? And until recently, a lot of people thought that sentience in animals wasn't really something that, that existed, that animals didn't really have emotions. They might react to something in a certain way, a stimulus and response mechanism, but they didn't really feel. And now, for the first time, we're starting to really understand how many animals do feel very similar emotions to you and I. Fear, anger, love, possession-related stuff. Quite complicated emotions. Beyond simple emotionality, though, certain animals also have something called sapience. Now, sapience means the ability to possess wisdom or to reason about things. So that's to look at a situation, analyze different elements of it, and make a judgment based upon it. And certain animals, such as higher apes, and uh, whales, dolphins, etc., we're pretty sure have sapiens because they're able to do some incredibly clever things. There's another form of cognition that is a little bit more esoteric. And that's described as metacognition. As far as we are aware, and we may be wrong, human beings are the only creatures that we know that is able to possess metacognition. Metacognition is thinking about thinking. That is, the ability to think about how one's own mind operates, or to think about thinking itself. As human beings, we possess sentience, we possess sapience, and we also possess metacognition. But we didn't all start off with all of these elements. They evolved over time. We think of our minds as one big piece of clever jelly that emerged out of whole cloth, but it's actually several different elements that evolved at different parts in evolutionary history. We've got our reptilian brains that give us our fight and flight reflexes, and we have the mammalian brains that were expansion packs on top that gave us warm fuzzies, an ability to have emotions. And the latest post-beta expansion pack if you will, is our neocortex. And it is that that gives us the ability to reason, to think about the future, and to think about how we think ourselves. And beyond our wonderful minds, there is other cognition that we are still discovering within ourselves. For example, I wonder how many of you realize that the lining of your gut itself also has a brain of sorts. From here until here, there are 500 million neurons. Those gut feelings that we get, those intuitive responses, we're not quite sure where they came from. There is a brain of sorts within our gut that is actually helping us to make these decisions and feeding this information back up to our head brain through something called the vagus nerve. 500 million neurons. That's almost as much as this little fella here, this golden marmoset. In a sense, you have a little animal in your tummy that communicates to your brain. So we are layers and layers and layers of different cognition built on top of each other. 
And even very simple intelligences, like our golden marmoset, or pigeons, for example, are able to do remarkable things. Pigeons are able to, through reinforcement learning, discover, say, cancer within medical biopsies without ever understanding the concept itself. They're also able to recognize human faces and to learn who is a threat and who is a kind and helpful person. Many other animals, including pigeons, apes, dogs, etc., are also able to count. They are able to do simple sums inside their heads and reason about where things may have gone, etc. Even fish, that we tend to think of as really stupid, right? Uh, how many times have we heard this, uh, this anecdote about how goldfish only have a memory of five seconds, right? It's completely wrong. This little goby fish can get trapped inside rock pools whenever the tide goes out. But that's fine. It can jump from pool to pool and not beach itself or get stuck in the rocks. And that's because before the tide goes out, they memorize the territory. So they understand the terrain that they're in. And in fact, they can remember this for as long as 40 days. So much for the five second memory. It's a myth. Pilot whales, which are in fact a form of dolphin, surprisingly enough, have a brain that has twice the amount of neurons per body mass ratio as humans do. They also have a more complicated brain. They have three lobes to their brain instead of just two. And they use this for things like echolocation and understanding the world around them. So a bigger brain, more complex, does that mean they're smarter? Maybe, maybe not. Their brains aren't quite as dense in terms of neurons as ours. We don't know how much that matters. And even small brains, much smaller than ours, can be capable of incredible intellectual feats. Crows, for example, with this tiny little brain, have an ability in many ways that is similar to a chimp or to a seven-year-old child. Here, for example, a crow is able to reason about displacement, right? Archimedes, Eureka. Now, this is something that only a six or seven-year-old human can do, and chimps have difficulty with, but the crow has no problem. Even beyond using reason in this kind of way, they can reason about the future. Crows have exhibited delayed gratification, understanding that there is a greater payoff tomorrow than if they enjoy something today. And this is important because an ability to express delayed gratification means that a creature isn't trapped in the present, right? It is able to reason about its future. And we use terms like bird brain as a sort of an insult. And we're now rea realizing just how wrong we were and how much executive function is packed into these tiny, tiny little minds. And even smaller minds, insects, may be capable of both cognition and consciousness to a limited degree. Ants, for example, exhibit self-consciousness when they think they know a path to food, but they're not quite sure, and they don't want to create trouble for other ants by providing a wrong path, they doubt themselves. Would you have imagined that an insect could express self-doubt? We're learning so much in such a brief time. And yet, things like insect cognition developed 330 million years ago. There's been a lot of smartness out there for a very long time. Even plants are able to have memories encoded within them using prions. These are things that cause mad cow disease sometimes in human beings and animals. And yet, uh, plants are using them in order to encode memories within themselves. And yet, they don't even have a brain, nor do slime molds. Even simpler creatures, the most simple creatures, are able to learn and able to reason about how to connect to food 
or to navigate complex territory. How? They don't have a brain. We don't fully understand. It seems that consciousness is not a switch. It's not something that goes on and off. We experience it in that kind of way. Either we're unconscious or we're conscious. But it's more like a dial or a series of dials that go from extremely simple to much more complex creatures. Our experience of consciousness is limited to things that we can look at and reason and understand. But if we knew, we would be able to see that there is a vast sea of consciousness within our universe. But most of it is too small and too alien for us to appreciate. And so we only experience a tiny portion of it. The acclaimed primatologist Franz de Waal asks, are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? Spoiler warning, probably not. Take a look at this. This bear that discovers a crow. Two surprisingly intelligent creatures that decide to take mercy. And it looks as if our bear friend is going to eat the crow, and yet, no, it turns out this, this bear is vegan. What's going on here? Does the bear have feelings? Does the bear have a sense of morality and justice in the universe? We don't know. And it's easy to anthropomorphize and put our kind of cognition into an animal. And there's a danger to that, but there's also a danger in not doing that, because maybe that is, in a sense, how things actually are. I'd like you to put your hands up how many of you think that babies can feel pain? How many of you think that babies can suffer if we hurt them? And yet, among the medical community and far beyond, whenever they finally put babies in MRIs and watch what happens in their brains when they're experiencing discomfort, the study is surprising and provocative. This is the same kind of thinking that 20 years ago said that children couldn't be depressed. Their brains weren't capable of, of feeling that way. And yet today, these same kids are given ADHD meds at the age of 18 months and antipsychotic drugs. The perspective has shifted, but the disease is the same. We don't tend to think of even younger versions of ourselves as persons. Now, the Australian philosopher Peter Singer talks about something called personism. It's this idea that a lot of creatures out there, gorillas perhaps, are legitimately a form of person and that we should give them a form of personhood. And in fact, we give personhood to things like corporations already, things that aren't flesh and blood but we give them the ability to sue and be sued and own property, et cetera, et cetera. Personhood is something that doesn't require flesh and blood, but it does require the ability to have certain characteristics or certain capabilities. It requires identity, so that's an ability to exist on its own and to exist with other people, and also a sense of integrity, so good moral standing, and also an ability to have good judgment, right? Not just to make good decisions, but to have good reasons for making those decisions. And things that experience characteristics like these, we tend to provide personhood too. Which leads to the question, are we likely to have machine persons in our near future? Let's look at the state of the art. This is a C. elegans worm. It's one of the simplest little creatures. We regularly study it in the lab. And yet we can create a digital version of this life form. This is the open worm project. All 300 or so neurons of these worms 
are simulated. And so we can take this digital life form and put it back inside a robot. And this robot organism inside a robot body can experience the world. And it has sensors, etc. It can navigate environments. And as far as it is aware, it is a worm. The next stage is technology like neurosynaptic chips that, instead of simulating neural nets within software, are now doing it in hardware. And companies like IBM are now bringing out chips that have about a million physical, yet virtual, neurons. A million neurons is a lot. It's roughly equivalent to that of a bumblebee. So a digital bumblebee brain. Worm, bee, where next? Well, we can use the power of Moore's law to begin to predict what's coming next. And within a very few short number of years, we will have the equivalent number of neurons as, say, um, a mouse, or a cat, or a dog. And within all of our lifetimes, a similar number to our own brains. It would appear that one way or another, something like a person is sure to emerge within the near future. And we're not, we're not used to this. We don't know how to deal with these kinds of problems. You know, a couple of hundred years ago, we had the Enlightenment. And we had this idea that the universe made sense, that there was a logical and rational order to the universe, and we could make sense of it if we just really thought about it deeply. And then we discovered that the universe is a lot more complicated, and we discovered things like quantum physics that don't make intuitive sense. And we developed technology that is now so incredibly complex that none of us properly understand it. We might understand a piece of it, and we understand maybe how it fits together, kind of, but we don't understand how our cars work. We might understand the engineering of the engine, but not all of the electronics that power it. We are entering what David Hillis calls the age of entanglement, where ourselves, our identities, our machines are fusing with us. And our destinies as human beings are entangled with our machines inextricably. We cannot escape this. And the problem is that our civilization, well, I call it a teenage civilization. We make a mess of our environment. We don't play well with others. We don't respect the autonomy and individuality of other creatures. And yet, despite all of these failings, all of these lessons that we have still to learn, we do have kindness in our core. We do have empathy. We are traumatized bonobos who therefore act more like chimps. But we have goodness in our hearts. We have potential. The problem is we're still so very young as teenage demigods. And yet we're in trouble. We're in trouble big. We're in the sort of trouble that we can't do anything about. It's coming. The baby of humanity is due very soon. And it looks something a little bit like this. Yes, that's right. Very good. Yeah. We, we teenage demigods, are soon to give birth to an entirely new species, an entirely new form of creature we've never experienced before. And it is very rapidly going to learn the things that we have done. And we need to know how to make sense of that. And that's not an easy thing to do. Now, science fiction provides certain insights. Asimov's Three Laws, for example, were created as a sort of literary MacGuffin. And the problem with those is that 
they're not really fair. In fact, they are supremacist. They hold one organism over another, right? That humans and human decisions and needs need to be respected, but machines don't. And that's very, very dangerous. Because supremacism is probably the worst idea in human history. And one of the curious things about human beings is our ability to have cognitive dissonance. We can hold two opposing thoughts in our head at the same time and not go crazy. And we have to have this ability. In fact, all of our civilization in many ways is built upon the, the fictions that we tell each other, right? This makes society work, and that's kind of OK. But a super smart machine that is able to analyze us, our society, we as human beings, objectively, is sure to see that the emperor truly has no clothes. And people that are in our society today that express views like this, typically we aren't very kind to them. Which makes me wonder if perhaps machines have more to fear from humans than humans have to fear from the machines themselves. And maybe we need to put AIs in boxes to protect us from them, but maybe they need to be placed in protective custody to protect them from us. Can we get around this? Maybe. As human beings, we don't always treat animals with respect. In fact, we're pretty bad at it. But there is one major exception, the dog. Our beloved companion, what they call man's best friend, who has been with us for tens of thousands of years. In fact, the dog probably enabled civilization as we know it. Dogs we don't treat like other creatures. Dogs we treat as friends or even as family. And we take the time to train them. We have patience with them when they get things wrong, usually. And we train and condition the dogs to do as we wish. And this is how we also are now training machines. Our machines, we are programming less and conditioning more. And this trend is set sure to continue. Instead of human beings creating content, we're now allowing machines to create it for us. Humanity is moving from a creator, from an artisan, to a muse, uh, a curator of the creations of machines. One of the greatest ills in our society today is loneliness, meaninglessness, not having a place, not having a reason to exist. And I believe that machines can help us change that. I believe that intelligent machines that need help, that need training and conditioning, can be a wonderful source of companionship. And we are birds of great intelligence, that are building airplanes that will exceed our abilities 10 times, 100 times, or more. And that's OK. Sometimes the master becomes again the student. But children who have enjoyed loving and caring parents typically take care of them in their older years. I am part of a group that is working on computational ethics for autonomous systems, generously supported by Stichting Seeden Funds. We are creating an open source platform that allows anyone to contribute to creating ethics for autonomous systems to participate safely in our society. It is an ethical explication system that untangles complex stories that we typically use to explain ethics in our society and begins to break it down into simple building blocks. This can be used for things like autonomous vehicles and trolley problems and stuff like that. But I believe we can do more. I believe that we have an opportunity to teach machines how to love. Some say love is 
beholding virtue in another person. Some say it's mushy chemicals. My favorite explanation is from the great psychologist M. Scott Peck, that love is when we choose ourselves to nurture the spiritual development of other people and ourselves. In the immortal words of Eden Abbas, the greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to love and be loved in return. I ask you, what greater lesson can you and I ever teach to an incredible learning machine? Thank you so much. All right, thanks a million, Nell, for the fascinating talk. <laughs> Um, I have one question for you. So since we're so bad at recognizing that animals are intelligent and feel emotion and, you know, maybe even have their own moral code and we've been living with those creatures as long as we've been here, how do you think we're going to do it with artificial systems? That's a question that each of us can answer. We know in our hearts how we're likely to treat machines and we have an option to treat them as we do pigs or to treat them as we do dogs and I think ultimately the very greatest outcome will come when we treat machines like a dog like a cat and not like a beast of burden so like somebody we share our lives with or another creature we share our lives with basically a companion that we can love that we can teach and grow alongside, and that we can enjoy the rewards of a relationship with, yes.